many of you know that we are indeed in the presence of our Savior? You know, sometimes we we think that this God is this faraway God, but the God is a very present God. He is here, He is now, He is within us, and I just praise Him this morning. Now, I want to welcome everybody to the Odyssey Church, and if you weren't here last week, we sort of understand because it was Super Bowl Sunday, and uh, everybody said that Brady was too old, and he wasn't going to make it, it'd be a cold day before he ever got a super, another Super Bowl ring. Let me tell you, for those that were here last week, it was cold in here last week. And he did indeed win, so congratulations to them. As long as nobody got hurt at the end of the game and they played fairly, good game. And didn't matter to me who won. So for you Patriots fan, congratulations. For those Seahawks Woo! fans, next year. So, <laughs> And for us Ravens fans, well, what can I say? <laughs> but we are back here this morning and we thank you. We got some really exciting things coming up. Um, I'm just going to go over a few of them. I told you last week we'd have a surprise for you. That'll be coming up here in just a little while. But uh, it's hard for me to believe that we are almost in the Easter season already. Uh, Easter season officially ca uh, kicks off next Wednesday, February the 18th, on what we've known in the church as Ash Wednesday. And we are going to have an Ash Wednesday service here at 7 o'clock. It's going to be a very special service. We encourage you to put it on your calendars and to come out and to join us. Six. It's at six. It's at 6, okay, I'm sorry, it's at 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, I've got 7 o'clock wrote down, my apologies. And then, uh, as you know, our vision and our mission here at the Odyssey Church is to help people find and follow Jesus, and along with that, Friday night has always been our movie night, so Friday night, this Friday night we won't have a movie, but following the 18th service of Ash Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we will have the movie called The Easter Experience. It's a great movie, I've seen it once before. Well, we're going to watch that. It's about an hour and a half long. And then starting every Friday night after that, for the six weeks before Christmas, we're going to do a small group study on that movie called The Easter Experience. And that starts at 7. We've put that into our bulletins for you. And we can actually put them on your refrigerator so you remember. Uh, I think that will help us all grow into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And since we are headed into the Eastern season, we're going to encourage you to come out next week as we start a brand new sermon series called Reverse the Curse as we follow Jesus as he goes to the cross and beyond. So we just ask you to, to spread the word, spread the good news, ask your friends and family to come out with you as we start a new sermon series. It's a great time to invite somebody because there's something new going on. And uh, if you will, right now we're going to ask you to stand, let's worship, let's get some blood pumping, and uh, we'll get to our surprise in just a little while. Let me pray for the service as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being in our presence. Father, we come to you today and we just ask that you take over. Father, in, in the book of Zephaniah, you said, let us rejoice in the small beginnings. Let us, Father, rejoice in our small beginnings as we look forward to what you can do through us what you can do through our community. And Father, help us to be your hands and feet. Fill us today with your Holy Spirit. Father, may we be lifted up. Father, we praise you and thank you in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hey, have you ever heard the saying, the devil's in the details? It appears the devil's in our computer today. Uh, we, we go over these slides. We go over it before the service starts, and all of a sudden they're missing. So... <laughs> Praise God, that must mean he has something great for us this morning. That's how I always look at it. If we're having a lot of trouble, that must mean that uh, God wants to do something great this morning. So we thank him, we praise him, and just a few seconds, we're going to go to our uh, tithes and offerings. But before we do, I uh, just uh, want to mention a couple things. Starting on March the 1st, uh, we are going to have a second service. Now, as you can see, it's not because we have so many people at the first service, although we have been blessed. We appreciate every single one of you that come out. But we also know I have a lot of people that I've talked to that say 9.30 is just too early for them to get up. So uh, we're going to try to make it easier for them to find and follow Jesus by having the 11.15 service as well. So we thank you and we praise God for what he's doing. But we're also going to make it possible for some of the people that, that come on a fairly regular basis that uh, want to volunteer in one service but still want to hear this hear the message to be able to volunteer at the first service as we provide child care and some of the other things that that we should do as the body of Christ so I want to thank you I want to tell you how much I really appreciate you how much I love you how much I thank you for what you have done for us and what you're going to continue to do for us we have been able to help so many people uh, financially because of your giving and uh, your generosity 
Uh, because of that, you've allowed me the time to be a better pastor. I was able to go to Easton this week. I was able to go to Seaford this week. I was able to go to Milford this week and to minister people in the hospitals and in the nursing homes. And uh, just this week alone, I, I probably I, 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 two or three uh, uh, people that I've met with, one guy, a young boy, who's getting ready to go through back surgery. And I couldn't do that if it wasn't for people just like yourself. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate that. Uh, as you can see, we're always getting constantly getting uh, building the church up, getting new chairs and things like that to make it easier for you to invite people to come to help them find and follow Jesus. But again, I couldn't do that without you. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate all of you and what you do for us. Now, if you were here last week, if you weren't last here last week, that's okay. I ask you to get five names of people that uh, we uh, we could, that aren't going to church right now that maybe you could invite to Easter Sunday service. Easter's a great day to invite people to church. Some Sundays are easier to invite than others. Easter's probably the easiest day of the year to invite people to church. So this week what I did was I, I put uh, a little thing in, in your bulletins. You can put the names on that. Uh, and then put their addresses on it. As you can see, I'm an overachiever, and as pastor, I thought I would lead by example. I've already got not just five names. I've got eight names on mine, and uh, I've got their addresses. And if you will, take your smartphone or take your uh, calendars and, or your address books and write their addresses in, bring them back next week. You just put them in the basket as you come in or during the tithes and offering if you already have it. And the reason I ask you to do that is we're going to try to make it even easier for you to invite people. We are going to send them simply an invitation. We're not going to call them. If you notice, I didn't ask for email addresses. I didn't ask for phone numbers. We're just going to simply mail them an invitation sometime about two weeks before Easter to invite them to come to the Odyssey Church and spend time with us. And we're going to have a big service that day. We, we're in the plans. We're working uh, for entertainment uh, after the service, for food after the service. We're, we want to have a big, big day that day. So we're working very hard in that direction. You'll hear more about that as we go along. But... When you call and invite them to church, they're already going to have something from us. So it won't be a cold call, it'll be a warm call. So we, uh, we just want to make it as easy as possible for you to invite non-church people to come to church that day. So if that's okay, you can fill them out now or you can bring them back next week. But uh, we do want to invite as many people as we can. Because if we look at our whole Christian calendar, Easter to me is the most important day of the year. It's the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the day that everything that our and a God that lived for us and a God that died for us, a, a lot of religions have that. But we have an empty tomb. We have a God that was resurrected for us. And we want people to know the good news that they can have in Jesus Christ. So as I ask uh, Caleb to come up and take our morning offering and pass it around, I want you to enjoy this video, and uh, then your surprise is going to be right up here on the stage.
And I'm going to kill Rob, but I'm your surprise. <laughs> I'm like, you're not going to introduce me or anything. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jennifer. And um, I'm going to use a mic because, to be quite honest, I have a cold. And I apologize now if I start coughing. But I can't talk very loud, so I'm going to put the mic up and hopefully you can help hear me. <coughs> so, what is the cost of following Jesus? What does it take to have to completely and blindly devote your life to God? What do you have to do? What do you have to find? What do you have to give? And what do you have to give up? And why does Matthew choose to talk about this in the middle, not the beginning or the end, of a chapter that is not about following Jesus, actually, or obeying God's law, or listening to the Holy Spirit, even, but it's in the middle of a chapter on healing? Why? Matthew chapter 8 is where we're going to begin this morning, and I know we're skipping ahead from where Rob left off last week. Last week we were in chapter 2, and I'm not saying that chapters 3 through 7 aren't good chapters, or they don't have anything important in them, or you shouldn't read them. You should. But I want to skip ahead today and discuss the cost of being a believer. You see, we've been talking about how Jesus was the one the prophets spoke about. We've talked about how he tells us how to live and think. We talked about how Jesus didn't say, let me tell you I'm the Son of God. Instead, he simply said, follow me and see if you think I am the Son of God, the King of Kings. So today I want to take it a step further and turn it back on us as Jesus himself did. Jesus left it up to us and to those who followed him to decide if he was the Savior. And if it was worth the price to pay to follow him. Matthew chapter 8 is often called the chapter of healing. And that's because in verses 1 to 17 and again 28 to 34, Jesus heals so many people that not a single translation of the Bible I can find. The New Living Translation, which is what we read out of each week here. The NIV, the King James, New King James, God's Words Message. Not a single translation I can find says exactly how many. Instead, they use the same term, which is very rare for different translations. They use the same term, many. Many meaning lots. Lots and lots and lots and lots. And it starts out with Jesus healing a man from everyone's favorite biblical disease, leprosy. When I was a kid, I was fascinated with leprosy, and that's because every other week in church, it seemed like they were talking about how someone had leprosy. Someone was healed from leprosy, someone was suffering or dying from leprosy. It was all leprosy all the time. So I looked it up. I was curious. What's leprosy? It's a disease that affects your skin outwardly. You get scars and open wounds, blisters that ooze pus. You smell, and you are contagious. People with leprosy were often kept in towns or farms on their own, alone, isolated. Yet one day, a man with leprosy climbs down a mountain, pushes his way through the crowds, good luck trying to avoid touching him, and asks Jesus to heal him. And Jesus does. From there, it talks about people. Jesus healing Peter's mother, the demon-possessed, and if you keep reading into chapter 9, it even tells the famous story of Jesus healing the blind man. <coughs> he healed everyone, it seems, from everything. Many people, lots and lots. Yet buried in this chapter showing how Jesus is the ultimate healer is a small passage that talks about what it takes to be a follower of Christ. Which made me ask myself, why would Matthew put such a significant passage. When we say cost, we're talking about what you have to pay to follow Jesus, and not only Jesus, the Son of God, but God himself. Why put it in the middle of the chapter on healing? The verses we're going to be looking at specifically today are in chapter 8, verses 18 to 22, and these verses have a subheading in most Bibles that say the cost of following Jesus. The story goes like this. Jesus has just healed all these many people and wants to go and rest, but the crowds are following him. Say, wow, you have all these people. I want to go with you. And it goes like this. The words are going to be up on the screen. Pastor Rob can do tech. And I invite you to read along in your Bibles, but underline this sticks out to you. <coughs> Verse 18 starts out like this. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers of religious law said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. 
So do you get it? Do you see what the cost is? What you have to give and give up to follow the King of Kings to truly have eternal life? The cost of following Jesus is something I personally am in the middle of right now, and it's why I'm speaking on it today. Over the past few years, God has taken me on a journey that started with me being broken and shattered and completely torn down. Then he slowly has built me up and raised me to where I am now. A work in progress, but someone who has come further in her walk with the Lord than I ever imagined. And I realized in order to do that, to fully give myself over to God, I had to do exactly what chapter 8, the entire chapter, tells us to do. Have faith. Ultimate, unending faith in Jesus being the ultimate healer. I had to be healed, then I had to leave a lot behind, bury that which was spiritually dead inside and around me to truly follow God. Let me explain, and I'm going to back up to chapter 8 to verse 5. It tells the story of the one and only time that Jesus is impressed. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed in terrible pain. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Yet the soldier resists. He doesn't want Jesus to come to his house in person. The soldier knows he isn't good enough to have the Son of God making household. The verse continues, But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. I have to stop right here right, for a minute, because if I approach Jesus, son of the almighty, everlasting God, actually God himself in human form, and asked him to heal my servant, my slave, and Jesus said, I'll be right there, I don't know that I would question him. Or do what the soldier did and tell him not to come. Instead, I think I'd be calling my house and telling my girls to clean up really quickly. Pick up your toys. God is coming over. <laughs> and if I was a man as powerful as Jesus, I don't know that I would take to being kindly to being told, no, you can't come over. Just stay there. It's fine. I would be afraid of, of, of offending or upsetting Jesus. Really afraid. I will also add that I personally have a lot of soldiers in my own family, and I can tell you that even 2,000 years later, they still expect their orders to be obeyed, and that they will also always follow their commanding orders. In this case, the soldier knows, as we know, that the commanding officer above all isn't some four-star general, it's this man standing in front of him. Yet once again, Jesus surprises us, surprises me at least. He's not offended at being told not to go to this guy's house. He's not upset. Instead, he's impressed. He replies, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. Someone impressed Jesus the Christ. God himself in human form. This is God, the entity that created the entire universe and literally breathed life into man and woman. Yet this soldier, who should have been hunting Jesus, looking for a reason to arrest him, impresses him. Why? <coughs> because the soldier had faith, not in what he was seeing, not in what was physically being done in front of him, but in the power of Jesus himself. And just that, in the power of Jesus' words. The soldier says, I know you have the ultimate authority, and I know how authority works. You say the word, and it will be done. Easy, right? It should be. It can be. It will be. Yet it's also a giant leap of faith, pun intended and intentional. You see, the first step in following Jesus is accepting you are broken and need to be healed. That others around you are also broken. That no one is perfect. We are all sinners and we all need improvement. Someone used to tell me growing up, there only lived one perfect man, and he died on the cross when he was 33. Guess what? I'm past the age of 33, so I don't think I'm that man. And when I accepted that I was broken, wow, did things happen. To me and to others who have taken the same journey. It's a long story how a girl I once knew ended up taking a walk in the woods off the campus of a college in southern Virginia. But when she was 18, that's exactly where she was, walking and talking. To God. You see, this girl, she has a horrible sense of direction. 
can't tell the west from the sun is setting and the east from the sun is rising. She gets lost very easily. So every time she takes a walk or goes somewhere new, she says this quick prayer. God, help me find my way home. Only this time she said it differently. You see, this girl was at a crossroads in her life and not sure what direction her life was going in. 18 is one of those ages where our life is suddenly stretched out before us, yet we are leaving a big part of our life, our entire childhood, in fact, behind. In this girl's life, a long-term relationship was falling apart. She didn't have a job, didn't know if she was going to get a job or go to college. She was lost, like so many at that stage of their lives are. So this time when she prayed for God to help her find her way home from those woods, it went deeper than finding the actual house she was staying at. Instead, she said this, Jesus, help me find my way. I'm lost, I'm broken, but I believe in you. So please come to me, help me, show me, heal me. This girl wasn't in church. She wasn't anywhere near a church. And she didn't have to be to find Jesus. She didn't have to have Jesus over for dinner. She didn't have to be a great biblical scholar. She simply sought out Jesus' love and acceptance from where she was, and even though she was hundreds of miles away from her earthly home, she was right at the front door of her eternal home. She simply had to ask to come in. She simply had to believe that Jesus was her commanding officer and ask him to come home to her heart. And he did. She was saved. Jesus came into this girl's heart, and she found her way back home to a place she was staying. She was different. She was no longer lost. And after a lifetime of going to church and Sunday school and youth group and Bible study, she finally stopped just following Jesus and started believing in him. That's the second step. The second step in paying the price of following Jesus is just that. Stop just following him and start believing in him. Now, when we get saved, we often like to think our lives will be perfect and we will never have any more problems in ever again. We are saved. Life, God has saved us. Life is awesome. It's perfect. No, 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 never. Actually, I think it's harder. That's because when you are no longer spiritually dead, as Matthew states, you are now alive in God. And being alive in God means seeing things with new eyes and realizing that the rest of the world isn't always as alive as well. Yet there will be times of rejoicing. God gives us the good because he is good all the time. But bad things happen, and they often happen at the same time the good is happening. That is sometimes referred to as spiritual warfare. The good is battling with the bad, and it's a fight over you, over what you will become. When I myself got saved, meaning I was now alive, I thought I was truly devoted to God, and for a short time I was. Then life happened, as life does, and slowly but surely I ended up putting life first and God second. And that's because when you truly follow God, you have to stay constant in it, in Him, in His words, in His life, in His faith. It doesn't mean we still aren't children of God, that we aren't saved anymore. You only get saved once. After that, though, you have to constantly recommit yourself, constantly remind yourself that God is God, the ultimate everything. And that's hard for me because that means letting God have complete control over your life completely and totally giving it to him, which for a control freak like me is next to impossible. The first cost of following Jesus is believing truly that Jesus is in command. The next step comes when you do that, when you give your life over to Jesus and God, it will not go as you planned at all. Seven years ago, I had a great life. I had a full-time job with a fortune, not 500, but 100 company that wanted to see me stay with them and consistently grew my job and my responsibilities. I had two gorgeous children, and everyone kept telling me how pretty they were and how awesome they are. And they are. I had a husband who stayed home with them during the day and worked nights. We took frequent trips to visit our family. We lived in a nice house. I had nice clothes and a decent car and more than enough food on the table and lots of friends I went out with. My life seemed to be pretty good. And I was miserable. I absolutely hated every second of it. Hated the job, hated the house, hated the car, hated the family. I was miserable, a loser. I was depressed. I was lost. Beyond depressed, I had a breakdown, a big one, and ended up in the emergency room one Friday afternoon lying on a bed. I wasn't asleep, though the people in the room with me thought I was. No, instead I was crying. Inside, though, not outwardly. In my head, in my heart, though, I was bawling my eyes out. 
Yet the people around me thought I was simply sleeping, peacefully even. I wasn't asleep and I wasn't dead, though I wanted to be. So I cried out to God to end my life. And this is exactly what I said. God, I don't want to live anymore. So please take my life. And do you know what happens when you beg God to take your life? He doesn't kill you. Instead, he brings you back to his life. To his life. And I will be very honest and very raw when I admit that while part of me was very happy that God let me live, a tiny part of me, the stubborn part probably, said, okay, when I said take my life, I didn't mean like literally take my life and tell me where to go from here. I meant take my life. You ever try to argue with a God? You ever win? See, I tried to argue with the God, and he won, big time. I told God to take my life, and he took it, right away, like within a week, actually. He led me to a church I had driven by hundreds of times but never noticed before. He led me to a group of women who insisted on throwing the word of God at me, and even worse, praying for me, and with me. God took me and my life and my soul and made it spiritually healed. I was no longer broken. I was no longer lost. What has followed in the years since has gone from praying for me to with me, to being included in Sunday school classes and small groups, from helping simply with the paperwork to helping run programs for children and teens, from sitting in the congregation to leading worship services, from being prayed over to leading prayer. God has taken me on such an amazing spiritual journey, and in such a short time, I admit I am at times afraid to ask him where it will take me next. It hasn't been an easy path, though. Along the way, I've lost a lot of friends and even some family. A lot of people have tried to attack me, bring me down. And I've had to move past all of them. I've had to leave some of my favorite things behind, change what books I read, what movies I watch, turn away from friendships because they came on the condition of temptation and sin. These books and movies and even people were spiritually dead, and I didn't even stop to bury them. I just moved on, getting closer and closer to God. That's the cost you pay when you take up your cross, as they say, to follow Jesus. It doesn't come without a price, and it is a painful one at times. I've had to completely rehaul my life, slowly, bit by bit. I take faith that moving on from these things and leaving them behind is what God calls us to do because he had his son speak on this very thing as it states in Matthew 8.22, Follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Jesus knows that we want to be healed, to be made whole again. He knows that our hearts are pure and we are trying to live our lives the way he wants us to, moving closer to him bit by bit. He also knows that when we waste our time burying our past sins, we waste time we could be spending living for him. Instead of wallowing in our sickness and burying those past ill, God wants us to move forward following him now. It's easy. It really is as easy as genuinely crying out to God and asking him to heal you, to fix you, to take your life for his use. It also is hard, especially today when we are so open and into sharing everything. Turning away from things God doesn't approve of is something I still struggle with. And it's made harder because most people, even those who say they're followers of Christ, don't always do or understand why you do it. Living in God's world is a nonstop thing. We've all heard the saying, don't quit on God, he never quits on you. I'd like to tell you that ever since I told God those years ago to take my life, please, I haven't once ever questioned or stumbled or thought about giving up. The truth is, again, I'm not that one perfect human being who ever lived. I'm a typical human being, and typical humans stumble. We cry and scream and hurt, ourselves and others. We mess up. We make mistakes. We sin constantly. I once read a book by a pastor named Richard Morris. Richard Morris is a pastor who has a very deep relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's a pastor of a huge church and travels all over the world spreading God's word and saving souls and reclaiming people for God. Yet he speaks about a time when he was traveling and he was in a hotel room when a movie came on. And he knew it was not a good movie. It was not spiritually right. Yet he watched it anyways. He sinned. He messed up. Now if it was God who was human... God might get mad at Richard and take away his unique abilities to spread the word of God and the Holy Spirit. 
Instead, God gave Richard the opportunity to realize that Richard had made a mistake, that he had sinned. And when Richard realized that and repented, he went on to actually have an amazing talk at the church and save a lot of people. We are going to mess up in our, along our way in our journey following Christ. God knows it. He expects it. What we have to do then is admit our mistakes, ask for forgiveness, and then get right back on the path of obeying God. Moving on and learning what not to do until it becomes so automatic, we suddenly don't even realize we are now living not for ourselves, but for God. The final step in following Jesus is the deepest. It's the one that will cost you the most. It's when you wake up one day or get in your car or come in your door, go to a restaurant with friends, and realize you are not the same person you once were. Becoming self-aware of the changes in yourself and the difference in your life is the deepest cost because it actually can be physically painful. As you recall all the fun you were having all the time, so you laughed at the obscene jokes or sang along with the crazy song on the radio. I say it hurts because we don't often remember that the song was filled with bad words or about doing stupid things. We don't remember that the joke was often at the expense of another person. We just remember how much fun we had and how happy it made us at the time. Then the happiness faded and we were left, left feeling empty and hollow and searching for the next stupid or rude thing to make us smile again. Why? Because these things are temporary. The happiness they bring you is temporary. Joy in living a Christ-filled life is permanent and eternal, as in forever and ever and ever, in this lifetime and the next. Yet after the pain of remembering the temporary high is followed by the sense of everlasting <coughs> joy, knowing you are truly where you are meant to be, that while some of your friends and family may think you've gone off the deep end into this Jesus freak, the fact is you are a child of God, a sinner saved by grace, and all those adjectives we like to throw around. Deciding to leave behind that which is dead is the easiest decision you will ever make. It will also make your life harder than before, but I guarantee it, it will make life worth living. For now and for eternity. Forever. And Matthew knew this. He knew those who truly followed Jesus lived a difficult life. They traveled constantly. They never knew where their next meal was coming from. They never saw their families. And Matthew's had a good life up to this point, as we've discussed. He spent his days surrounded by partiers, the wine flowing freely, collecting money not only for the government, but for himself. And then one day he simply leaves all of that behind. He doesn't look back. He just keeps his eyes fixed on Jesus and on his teachings. He witnesses miracle after miracle as Jesus changes the lives around him. Think about this. Jesus healed all the many. Many that were probably going to die soon, and instead they lived. Not only were the healed changed, but those around them were also changed. And it's this healing that prompted the religious league teachers in the crowds to follow Jesus on his travels. They wanted to be a part of what was going on, this healing from sickness and disease to evil taking over lives, to death even. They wanted to be a part of it, and have, but they have to leave everything else and everyone who isn't following Jesus behind. That's what <coughs> Jesus was referring to when he said spiritually dead. People and places and things that didn't align with what the Word of God speaks of. Do I still watch television? Yes. Do I still read books other than my Bible? Yes. Do I still enjoy movies? Yes. Just different ones. Or same ones, but with a different perspective. And I'm not saying that if you read certain books or watch certain movies or hang out with certain people, you're going to go straight to hell. That's not for me to say. What I'm saying is your relationship with Christ grows as you go deeper with God you will learn in your own heart what is spiritually dead. You will learn how to listen to God and how to make out his voice among the many that crowd our minds and lives today. Sometimes you have to step back. Sometimes you have to keep going. But you do learn what God wants for you. And when you do finally give in and give it to God, as the saying goes, suddenly the spiritually dead are as clear as someone with leprosy. You will see the inner scars and wounds and blisters. You will smell the stink of things not godly and good. It's a lesson a member of our church is learning right now. If you've been coming to the Odyssey since the beginning, you may remember a girl named Chelsea. Chelsea is memorable here at the Odyssey for two things. One, she was the girl who would stand on the side of the highway with a sign waiting for people to come in. 
And two, she gave her testimony back in October and November about how she was in the middle of learning how to truly follow Christ. Chelsea is still learning that lesson, only not here at home. Currently, Chelsea is at a center in Philadelphia called Teen Challenge Training Center. And while she is there, she is learning what to keep in her life with Christ and what to leave behind. As we end today, I want to play you a video she filmed as it sums up better than I ever can what it means in today's world to do as Jesus said, Matthew says, Jesus instructed us, let the spiritually dead bury their dead. Right now, I feel like I'm in a cage, but I ain't in a cage. I'm actually a slave to this sin. I'm in the processing and making a key to set me free. Right now, I'm blind, but in the future, the Lord will help me see the light. Then I'll be able to take flight to my God, the Most High. No more chasing the artificial high. No more staring at that screen till I cry. Instead of hitting that bottle, I'll be hitting that Bible, that real truth. Jesus got crucified on the cross. Yeah, that's real proof. Yeah, I strayed away from God. I've been that prodigal son, but he still loves me. He set me free. Look up Luke 15, verses 11 to 32. Who's holding back from God? It has to be you. I once was lost, but now I find my identity in Christ. I was rolling jays with the enemy, but it's all a heist, man. It's all a lie. I believe those lies day after day. Down to the day I wanted to take my life away. I believe those lies my whole life. I believe the lies of the enemy. I believe the lies of the people that were supposed to be my family. All the pain and hurt I ever tried to cover up, Christ died for that. But now I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to be part of God's kingdom forever. somebody stronger than us. We need somebody more important than us, somebody bigger than us. And I found that, and Jennifer found that, and Chelsea found that in Jesus Christ. And there comes a day when we have to stop following. There comes a day when we have to start believing. And if you start believing and you read the scriptures, you have to start doing it. You have to take those things which are spiritually dead in you, and put them aside and start living, not for the spiritually dead, but for Him who is eternally alive. 
Jesus' first message, as he, if you know the story, he was baptized by John the Baptist, and immediately the Holy Spirit led him into the desert. As he comes out of the desert experience, his first word for repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And indeed, I say to you today, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. One close in prayer. And if any of you would like to see me after the service and talk about that, I'll be glad to do so. I would encourage you, the best thing that you can do for your unchurched friends is to invite them to church. Whether it's this church or another church, invite them to church because eternity is a very long time. We can love them here on earth, but the best decision that you can make and they can make is to leave eternity with Jesus Christ. And if you don't invite them to church, and you don't invite them, and don't tell them about this Jesus, you've done great harm. So I encourage you to take those papers home, fill them out, bring them back, let us pray over them, let us pray for them, let us make your job a whole lot easier, because all of us get a little... Uh, conscious about asking people to come to church, about asking people to, to, do, to, to find and follow Jesus, but we'll do the hard work for you. I want to thank Jennifer today for a very important message. Uh, it really makes me feel great that we have so many talented people in this church that uh, some days I can have a Sunday off and know that uh, we're going to hear a scripturally sound message. So God bless you all. Let me pray for you as we leave. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you today for the message that you've given us. For once again a reminder that to be eternally alive, we have to do away with that which is spiritually dead. Father, help us by the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that we cannot do this on our own, that we need your help to lead the life that you have called us to lead, to, to be that great mission field that you called us to be, to go out and fulfill the great commission, to bring others into your kingdom. And Father, help us to be your hands and feet here on earth. We ask all these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Go in peace of the Lord and remember Chelsea and remember what Christ has done for you. Thank you again and God bless.